Yeah, hi. Welcome to the He Talk Show from Human Engineers. And I'm Ramesh Ranjan, the editor and founder of He Talks and Human Engineers. I'm joined today uh, with Ms. Deepa Prahalad Abhyankar. And Deepa, thank you so much for uh, accepting an invitation being on this show. Thank you for having me, Ramesh. Thank you, Deepa. So Deepa Prahlad Abhyankar is an author, speaker, and internationally acclaimed innovation design strategist and consultant with an emphasis on emerging markets and social innovation. She's the author of Predictable Magic, Unleash the Power of Design Strategy to Transform Your Business, which was selected by Fast Company as one of the best design books of the year. She's also a frequent blogger on the Huffington Post, Harvard Business Review, and other publications. She shares her passion for emerging markets and innovation at leading companies and business schools such as Harvard, USC, and the University of Michigan. She actively supports several global efforts in memory of her late father, management guru, Dr. C.K. Prahalad, including the Prahlad Initiative at the University of Michigan. She's an elected member of the International Academy of Management and was ranked 34 on the inaugural Thinkers 50 India list. She's a member of Marshall Goldsmith's 100 Coaches Program. She serves on the advisory boards of Global Peter Drucker Forum, Arogya World, and is a patron of the India Spora Forum She's also an advisor and investor for Rematerials. An art enthusiast, she's on the board of committee for arts of the Indian subcontinent at the San Diego Museum of Art. Deepa, we are very privileged to have you on this show. Glad to be here, Ramesh. So, reducing product design and development lead times is assumed to be a universally good thing Delivering higher profits, increased market share, and greater market dominance to those who can get there first. While shorter design and development lead times is sometimes to be aimed for, the question is, how do you do it without cutting vital corners, increasing risks of raising cost? It's now called the design sprint. Deepa adds a new dimension to it. In her article, The New Fortune at the Bottom of the Pyramid, she has said, dramatic reduction in extreme poverty around the world has created opportunities for entrepreneurial solutions to many social problems. She's also stated that industry and civil society is ready to accept the narrative of innovation as the antidote to poverty. She believes that design should be at a fraction of a cost. A volatile world will require companies to create products and services that appeal to customers across a much wider swath of income levels. Therefore, innovations must have global scale and to achieve this, they must be able to address the needs of the bottom of the pyramid and that the BOP design elements must ensure low costs, ease of use, sustainability, and scale. So Deepa, before we start with our questions, would you want to say a few words to set the context? Yeah, I think that I really look at a lot of the challenges that you mentioned from the lens of design. And I think before we even delve into kind of the details of how we would address this in different markets, I think it's just important to understand the role that design plays in delivering profit and impact. And I, I wish I knew who made this quote. They just said, you know, design is the formal answer to a strategic question. Wow. And I think this really sums up, um, I think many of us know kind of the contours and the complexities. We're taught to study, um, you know, all of the different dimensions and be very aware of that. But end of the day, design is really a process of synthesis because that's what we need to do to actually deliver value. And I think if you break down design in a systematic fashion, I think there are three really important ideas where even policy and governments um, can't do this on their own, even if you have fantastic people at the helm. Right. For one, design transforms market size. 
market sizes are not fixed. If you look at the modern cell phone, for example, if you look at some of the old 80s movies and you see a five pound brick to what we're having today, that's a process of many, many different iterations. And that's a process that is about design, about adding features, about understanding how people could use this, having a different vision. And if you look at how that's traveled around the world, you see that, oh, you know, mobile banking was pioneered in Kenya. And, you know, so the local nuances have also been very powerful. And in the process, design has really increased inclusion. Today, right. there are 5 billion cell phones around the world. Um, the second is that, you know, the best ideas, you know, don't have impact in a vacuum. You know, for example, Gandhi had was not the first one to come up with the idea of Indian independence. That idea, right. that dream was floating around for a long time. But it was really in the creation of the Charka and also the narrative around economic self-sufficiency. Once that took root, then many people could participate and respond. But those things were created. They didn't always exist. And who that ended up being the tool. And the last thing is that you know, a lot of trends are kind of felt and experienced before they can be precisely measured. You know, I always say like people know that there are lots of dual income families. There are men who are becoming more involved with raising their children. You know, they're single sex couples. We all know those things. And the only thing a consultant could do is give you great precision on the obvious. Right. But what an entrepreneur and a designer would do is help people cope with change and say, you know, since these things are true, we need to put a diaper change facility in the men's restroom. We need to make sure that people are able to navigate this new reality. Um, and I think there's a couple of other really interesting points. Now we see in this current crisis that it's design is really a matter of life and death. When there are shortages, when there, I mean, how do I make a ventilator more efficient? How do I create masks in a very fast fashion? How do I redeploy my existing resources? And that takes imagination. But once that is communicated, a lot of people can very quickly do that. And, you know, in terms of profitability, the, the very profitable, well-loved, well-known companies are also design leaders. The brand leaders are design leaders. Those two are no longer separate. Thank you so much, uh, Deepa, for uh, setting the context and for your introductory remarks. And I think uh, never before in history, the need for design is more felt than the current situation with everyone grappling with the current COVID situation and no one really has a solution on hand. Now, one of the impediments for making products, services, and solutions available across geographies, social strata, and all income levels is a cost factor. One of the reasons for this high cost is the design and development of the product and the time it takes to develop them. As we all know in industry, time is money. Normally product development takes time somewhere between 18 to 36 months or even more. So Deepa, how do you think organizations can address the challenge of reducing the design life cycle, flattening the design curve from the lab to the market? Well, Ramesh, I really like your framing of saying, you know, we're flattening the design curve because I think that that is, you know, since design is now a key competitive arena, that it is important. Um, but there's no magical speed. Right. I think it's really, you know, industry specific in some cases um, and consumer expectations. I don't want somebody to tell me the car I just bought is out of date, you know, in, in a month, maybe <laughs> in a year or two, I want some updates. On the other hand, with software, so expectations are set. Um, in different ways. But I think um, what you see in any great design, there's, there's two elements. There's really the physical design of the product and service, and there is also the narrative around it. And internally, I think this culture and purpose of the organization is a huge factor in, as you say, flattening the curve. Because if people are engaged, if they know what the potential impact of what they're doing is, and they're excited about it, you see, um, a lot more tangible inputs for design, even before the design, you know, things like goodwill, things like patents, things like software development, all of these uh, things. And if you also see places where maybe there's less, um, you know, corporate output and marketable products, places like India and emerging markets, you do still see 
a lot of the creative inputs right. um, being created. But what we do need to do is create a mechanism for those pieces to be strung together. Like if you really look at what's happening today, suddenly individuals, organizations are saying, okay, we're not going, we're flattening the curve actually through collaboration very quickly. Um, and that's probably one of the most powerful ways to do it of suddenly people are saying, how do I redeploy what I have in very creative um, instances? And what I think that's simply just because now they can no longer put their social mission in a CSR bucket. Yes. It has to become very central because there is this existential threat. Um, and also people are saying, okay, how can I take this idea and this and quickly put it together? I've, I've seen this now with the shortage of, you know, simple, you know, masks, not the N95 or anything right. where community people on my neighborhood blog were posting, you know, look, I'm willing to stitch some masks. Here's a pattern. Does anyone have elastic? I'm out. So people came in and within a few days, there's already somebody who's saying, all right, here's some designs that don't require any stitching at all. This is what you can do at home. And already hospitals have had such a response. They are now created something called the 100 million mask project. So the right. scale can happen this in this case in weeks, right? I mean, sorry, in a matter of days, not weeks. Um, so I think the collaboration is a, a jet fuel to flattening the design curve. Um, and also really the idea of culture because a lot of good ideas there at, exist at different stages. Some people have even a, a crude product and prototype, then a lot of people can give feedback. Some people have a skill and that depends on the imagination of the organization to say, you know what, we are working on this problem and this skill is really going to be critical and they can place you. And, other cases, there are people who, and some of the greatest impact people have started out with neither of those things. They've started from a place of intention and said, I don't know how I'm going to do this, but I cannot stand to see this. So if you look at something like Akshay Patra, right. if you had asked them, what is your business model in year one or year two, they wouldn't be able to tell you, but there was no agenda other than service. Absolutely. And look at how they have been able to scale. So I think also sharing that narrative brings a lot of players. So it's not only like leveraging an ecosystem, which is kind of what we're taught in tech all the time. I think some of the really great innovations create the ecosystem itself, right? And that's a sign that you're on the right track. Absolutely. So um, I think you talked about involving the community and coming up with some solutions. So the word crowd has become very popular, crowdfunding, crowdsourcing, so maybe crowd designing or crowd innovation. <laughs> Talking of collaboration now, your uh, late father, Dr. Sikhar Prahlad, advocated the idea of co-creation and questioned why organizations alone should take the responsibility of creating new products and solutions. He propounded the idea of involving customers in the designs and development of new products. You also in your book, The Predictable Magic, unleashed the power of design strategy to transform your business. Talked about how firms should excite and engage their customers to the extent that they themselves become the market, the product to others. So can you elaborate on this and uh, do you think this will help flatten the design curve? Yeah, I mean, I think that there are a couple of things that make co-creation more possible earlier. I think getting people's feedback and views was a little bit more difficult and tech has really changed that. Um, and for all income groups, I think, you know, earlier people who wanted to do good still had to do a lot of guessing. Right. What I think is really exciting about technology is today we have big data for rich and poor alike. And so you don't have to do as much guessing, you know, provided you've cultivated the relationships, you can ask people directly and that really reduces the risk of, um, you know, new product introductions because you have a community that's already excited right. about what you're doing. And if you look at phenomenon like Kickstarter and everything, they've created that emotional investment prior to even having a physical product or service, and some of those are huge. I mean, they're, they're overselling um, their market um, already. And so you're tapping into the expertise and insight that requires building um, a lot of trust. But if you really look and see 
the products and services across sectors that really succeed, even in things like pharma today, they're really doing two things. You know, they're tapping, they're creating something that's shareable and they're creating something that makes people feel good about themselves. Right. As people want to have a way to engage in the community. And one of the things is to be this person who is sharing, you know, your knowledge, your insight, your experience. That's what, that's what we're trying to do. That's what consultants are doing right. is saying that I have learned this, but it has no value if only I know it. And companies also do that through their products. And I, I'm this person who's telling you that we're there. And if you look at what create, you know, the co-creation thing does is it just, a lot of companies have impact not because they created a perfect solution it's because they created a new range of choices and i think that's such a critical point you're not necessarily there to solve everybody's problems you're there to create a set of choices that allows them to do things that they wouldn't otherwise do absolutely um, so deepa um, i used to work for a company called american park conversion i'm sure you've heard of it uh, mm -hmm. market leader in the area of uh, uninterrupted power supply or UPS. They commanded a large market share in the world, but were finding it very difficult to penetrate into the Eastern or emerging economies like India, Southeast Asia, largely because the costs were very prohibitive and compared to the local companies. For long, the corporate leaders used to brag about their tagline, legendary reliability. So they would talk about the longevity of the product, the near zero failure rate, and reliability. But it came at a cost. So the idea of think global but act local was something which came up around that time. So my question to you is, what should be the trade-off between product value, that is the design, quality, reliability, and features, versus cost? And what should be the tipping point? Well, this is an interesting question um, because when people think about design, they tend to be really focused on the aesthetics and you know, right. like specific inputs. But what you really see today, and there's really this idea, well, some of the myths I think are that, well, quality is more important than design in my business. And actually design is a way to convey quality. And it's not a specific price point that you have to offer. Today, we actually have pretty sophisticated entry-level smartphones that are like $20. So what it takes to really um, have a cost point that is, make sense and at a quality level it's acceptable is to understand your consumer and never skirt on that investment understand not only what people can afford but what they value because sometimes you'll find that you may be chasing quality on a dimension that is not particularly important and maybe missing out on something that is Very so good. i think that this is really should be fueled by an understanding of what people are trying to achieve, what their aspirations are. And this is kind of a fascinating thing is even in the poorest parts of the world, if you look at what's been adopted at scale, it's cell phones, uh, you know, branded fashion, education, financial services. So none of those things are particularly a manifestation of need. Every one of those is an expression of aspiration. Absolutely. And I think this is a really critical point um, that even if you're trying to do something charitable or social, design is really important for making sure that it's adopted and it can make an impact, right? right? I mean, this is the whole thing that, you know, tomorrow everybody's uncertain uh, about the future and I, that, that doesn't mean that we've, lost our sense people still feel insulted by bad options and reject them whether or not they have better ones <laughs> um, and i think that's an important learning so i think to an extent quality is determined by um the consumer and and their values and the other thing is that you know this idea that well this is what delays product launches no actually indecision does and i think also cultural issues of not um really allowing enough voices to be heard and kind of doing what can be done rather than what will make an impact. When people are uncertain or they don't understand how it's going to impact the consumer, you tend to take very small bets and, and take, uh, you know, very uh, shy and tentative 
forays into the market. And then those tend to not work as well as a, a bold but well-considered option. Right. We have seen how uh, the, the likes of uh, the Mi phones are giving the uh, Samsung and Apple a run in this part of the world. Yeah, absolutely. And these phones are no way inferior to any of these uh, uh, premium phones. And they serve the purpose at the same time, it's also aesthetic and really good. Yeah, absolutely. There's no you know, exact correlation between uh, the cost and the final product, right? It's, it's about the thoughtfulness of the package and also how well the design and narrative match. Right. If I'm saying that this is some super high-end thing, then I need to match that. If I'm saying that this is a practical, hardy, you know, robust product that um, will not give out in, you know, the certain circumstances. Um, that's what it needs to be. So that's the interesting dilemma on the bottom of the pyramid, right? In some Absolutely. of those circumstances, um, people assume that designing for those markets will be cheaper. Not mm -hmm. really. I mean, in some places, the roughest terrain and all that, the, the minimum viable product is the, you know, Mercedes Benz engine. <laughs> so it's it just very highly dependent on uh, environment. And I think a classic example also nano, right? People try to push a cheap product, but the people at the bottom of the pyramid said, no, we don't want this. And uh, nano to some extent failed uh, in the Indian market. So Deep, Deepa, you said that design is a means to connect with people. And that emotional connection is a secret source of winning products and services. So is that the reason why Apple and Samsung have been able to churn out new products much faster than competition? because of the emotional connect with the consumers and at the same time also get away with anything. You remember <laughs> Galaxy Note 7 battery issue, the Apple iPhone 6 bending. If it was any other brand, I think that company would have gone bust. But uh, Samsung survived it, came up with Samsung 8, 9, 10, 11 now. <laughs> iPhones, iPhone survived it, came with 7, 8, 9, 10 and 11. So is that emotional connect uh, the secret source of winning products and services? Yeah, I, I absolutely think it is. If you look at even in developed markets where people have the ability to pay, you know, 80 to 90 percent of new product introductions fail and about 65 percent, you know, they just don't eat meat even internally right. derived um, kind of payback and, you know, success metrics. And the ones that do go beyond the price point and the marketing strategy because those are, are known dimensions in a lot of markets not in everyone what they do is they forge an emotional um connection and it's, it's an interesting point you're making a lot of brands they don't get away with everything what you really see is you know pay packages are skewed so it may feel that way that some of these companies make money no matter what but in reality the life cycle of CEOs and the life cycle of product introductions is shrinking pretty dramatically. Um, and even consumers, you know, who are invested in the stock market hold it for much shorter periods of time. So everyone has to keep on their toes. Um, and if you look at the United States, more CEOs were replaced over behavior than over performance last year. Right. Um, but what is interesting is product flaws and, you know, design mistakes can be forgiven if there are two conditions being met. One, if you have forged a relationship of trust and communication Absolutely. prior to that, and two, if you are also constantly communicating what you are doing to fix it, right? I mean, if you go to any brand and you complain, but they hear you and they try to correct it, that's why people can get away with mistakes sometimes. Just like when we have a good friend who maybe does something we didn't like, we don't end the relationship. Absolutely. And I think that's kind of how we forge our, um, you know, interactions with brands as well is, okay, they heard me, I was able to talk about it and they're also taking some action. So that's why I think it, and the, the data on emotional connection is quite interesting so, you know, we know Jim Collins' classic, uh, Good right. to Great, Good where he great. looked at um, a lot of industries and said, well, who had superior financial performance? And he tried to derive a set of attributes for those different firms. What, what were they doing differently? So there's a classic book, you know, by David Wolf, Raj Sisodia, and uh, Jagdish Sheth, who asked the question a little differently. It's called Firms of Endearment. And they said, what are the companies that people 
just open book. What do they love to interact with? Okay. okay, but there had to be a tangible element. Is this something that they recommend to friends? Would they drive a little bit more to get it? Would they pay a little bit extra? And they came up with a group of firms that they thought were superior at kind of having that fondness. And, and what they did is then they looked at the uh, financial aspect later. And what they found versus good to great firms was quite interesting that there was a steady performance over a three year period. The firms of endearment outperformed 1.7 to one over five years, okay. but they outperformed 3.1 to one over 10 years. So this is quite an interesting finding because everything we've been taught about competitive advantage and all that is that those advantages are short lived and they decrease. But emotional connection, even in this age of disruption, is one of the very few advantages that grows over time. So right. it's always worth your investment to care for people, to understand what their needs and aspirations are, and express that in the design itself. Right. So I also raised that in the context saying that maybe uh, Samsung and Galaxy also released half coup products to the market. and it because of the emotional connect consumers were willing to lap it up but only to realize later that they had some challenges with the product yeah i mean well i think that hey a battery exploding in your front pocket is a pretty big thing to ask anyone to forgive but they were able because they always were saying this is what i'm doing to help you right this is how we are correcting the problem and then they also made such an exciting product um, so that's an unusual case, and I don't think anybody should uh, count on that. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, I hope not. So Deepa, um, Netflix, Airbnb, Xiaomi, Reliant Geo, Uber and Ola, Paytm and Google Pay, Alibaba, have all disrupted their respective markets. They were rank outsiders but they came up with out of box ideas and disrupted well-established business models. So my question to you is, do you see disruptive innovation as the future? And do you see this trend of outsiders disrupting the traditional business and traditional bastions and stealing the market from under the carpet? Well, this is again, you know, quite an interesting um, question because a lot of people can make a splash, make an impact, whether they can do it sustainably, you know, is another question. And um, this is the thing that I find interesting about a lot of these models that are cited is again, a lot of them really innovated on customer experience right. and business model. I mean, Uber and Ola are not offering anything fundamentally new. I mean, there were taxis, there were rickshaws, there were other means of transport, but what they did is they brought these things closer to the consumer. You know, and the same thing with a lot of the financial services is that they basically removed barriers, made it much easier, they saved me time, thereby increasing my productivity. So a lot of these insights are again centered around um, you know, the consumer. And I think that's an important lesson that some of these disruptions are really just about removing barriers. Sometimes that's every bit as powerful as trying to come up with something totally new. And I think Muhammad Ali, you know, summed it up so well. He said, you know, it's not the mountains in the distance that wear people down. It's the pebble in your shoe. <laughs> and <laughs> I think that's the learning from a lot of these brands is that with education now, with everything else, what's going to happen is the more people that can participate, then that's the reason why these are propelled forward. So Zoom might have been a business tool three weeks ago. Today, children are using it right. today. So you know, earlier, I think a lot of tech entrepreneurs said, well, I wanna bring education to people who don't have access to school online. And some of them did it well, but you know, now that everybody is on it, people who've had access to the best schools and best teachers and the people who have never had access, when everyone is on the same platform, you're gonna be able to devise something that works so much better and is so much more engaging. And we can also maybe actually really live out that vision of exchanging ideas with people who are not just like-minded, but completely different from us as well. So basically leveraging technology and uh, providing superior consumer experience is what uh, these people have uh, 
Well, it's not, not always only technology. I think that creative redeploying of what you have. Now, for example, everyone knows, you know, legendary Sears Roebuck department store in the United States. And they even used to offer mail order kits to build a, an entire house from scratch. Right. And one of the owners, this Rosenthal, actually read a book by a freed slave who founded a university um, called, named Booker T. Washington. So he read this book up from slavery. And he was very moved by that as a first generation American immigrant. And he actually went to this Tuskegee Institute and, and met Booker T. Washington. And he said, okay, I'm really, I also believe in self-sufficiency and education. And they formed a friendship. And he said, look, a lot of the schools, like slavery had ended, but he said a lot of the schools in the South for black children are no better than stables. The spending is very different. We don't have teachers. Some of these teachers are struggling with 200 students and white children, I mean, they were still segregated schools. So he's like, and, and white children have a class of 30. So what he did was they devised a way, they mapped out the entire rural South before big data and said, okay, let us use the same technology and build schoolhouses that are nice. And they had such an interesting business model. You know, it was raised, money raised from the local black community from Sears, it put in their share, but the rest of it was actually, they went and talked to a lot of white business owners and said, it is in your interest to make sure that the labor you have to hire is better trained and better educated because now people can migrate to other parts of the country. And they also made sure that there was a teacher quarter so people stayed in. So this was 5,000 schools that were built and there are historians who are still today struggling to understand how big that impact was. They said that even for people who did not migrate north, who stayed locally, wages increased by about 30%. And you see a lot of luminaries in American culture who were the product of those schools. So I think it's really understanding the need. Sometimes you go so far out and do these crazy exercises to envision what's happening in 20 years. If you want to have impact in 20 years, do something for people today. So Deepa, you also said that design has to be a means of social justice. So isn't it imperative that organizations should strive to be inclusive in their marketing strategy and design strategy and keep the development costs down in order to be able to serve customers across a much wider geographical spread and income levels? Or should they persist with market differentiation strategy? You know, I, I don't think it's one or the other. I really think that firms have to decide their purpose. They have to decide how they go about it. They have some voice in the cultures they create. And customers have the luxury of voting, uh, you know, with their, with their dollars. Um, and that's what I'm, is, is trying to be inclusive is, you know, very complex problem. You know, this is the, the, the crux of the whole issue, um, you know, is, is that everything is not a, being inclusive doesn't mean necessarily making everything cheaper. It means making everything valuable. And that is a whole different issue. And I think this is where I, I said, tell brands and, and companies that I work with and even entrepreneurs that, you know, when you try to dumb down something at the end of the day, what you put on the shelf is a reflection of your capabilities and your values. It's not a comment on the consumer. Um, and, and they will make decisions about whether they accept or reject it. But I think today there's a, like I said, the, the changes that you mentioned at the beginning where there has been this big movement of people out of extreme poverty. And you know, right. unfortunately now suddenly we're seeing like backsliding that is very rapid around the world because of this crisis. So I think you really need to look at inclusion as an insurance policy, not just as a philosophical point, because right. you know, if the life cycle of you know, corporate leaders is shrinking, if the life cycle of whatever it is we can create, and if the demands of sustainability are also going up, we need to figure out how to serve a much larger group of people at the outset, because right. it becomes very difficult once you've made this investment in serving a very small group to go back and then try to change it again. Um, and what you see now is a lot of, you know, even entrepreneurs, uh, forget startups, if you are envisioning something which even if the strategy succeeds without any flaws at all, exactly as you planned, 
and it still is never going to touch, you know, 4 billion or 5 billion people in the world. I mean, guess what? Those same people have a lot of different choices going from the bottom up. And, you know, sometimes finding that middle ground is an important part of just being smart about what you produce, whether or not it ultimately ends up being low cost or not. If you are informed by the needs of people as they change, they'll connect with, um, with what it is you're doing. So continuing on this, uh, Deepa, currently we are faced with a very serious pandemic disease, the COVID-19 or coronavirus as popularly known, which has literally brought the world to a standstill. Our scientists, doctors, and administrators are grappling with the situation on how to save the lives and restore normalcy at the earliest. And this has become one of the biggest shutdown in the history of mankind. Yeah. The situation has demanded that we fight against time and come up with creative solutions to deal with the pandemic uh, in terms of arresting the spread of disease, curing the disease, and working towards a protection in the future through a vaccine. You and your husband, Ashwin, have been pioneering some work in this regard to find some solutions to some basic problems with the help of your friends and community. Understand that you have put up some resources which are available that can be used off the shelf. Can you please share about it for the benefit of larger audience? Absolutely. I mean, I think like everyone, we're just kind of shocked and alarmed. And when you see, when we have, you know, deep connections in India and around the world, they said if, if health systems that are so well developed are overwhelmed, we know that it's only going to be so much worse. And right. even here, you know, the difference in access to uh, facilities is becoming very obvious and the glaring omissions over the years are becoming visible. And um, we actually, I mean, we're not medical experts, but what we just did is we kept seeing all these inspiring stories of, oh, you know what, there is this, you know, low cost ventilator design and there is this um, person, this doctor who had figured out and they were all kind of piecemeal. So what we essentially did in, in a day is say, let's put these stories together with the links and with the drawings. So people who are trying to do something and have the capability don't have to hunt through 50 right. different articles. So, I mean, literally all we did was just for a few urgent things like, um, you know, ventilators and masks and face shields, this is the design. And what I was amazed to see is just by posting that, how many people all over started contacting us and saying, okay, you know what? we have a 3D printer, we have this, we have that, how do we go about it? And all we've essentially done is, is kind of do a few email introductions. I know one of the you know, um, labs, fab lab type of things in Nagpur, maker spaces, <coughs> we already said, you know, we kind of worked around the clock. Ventilator is a highly specialized thing, but right. we're able to make face shields right away. Um, and similarly, we're seeing that, you know, somebody who had created a, a design in, um, for a low cost ventilator from MIT, you know, sent an email and said, listen, um, is this design available? Can we share this? And they said, yes. And in fact, we're updating it because now so many people need this. Um, and so we're, we just kind of been a conduit, but I think what this is, and, and many others are doing the same and more. And if you see now the response from industry is just unbelievable. Um, you know, huge brands, Ikea, Zara, everybody, um, you know, redeploying their, their resources in creative ways. But that also gives me a lot of hope that, you know, the community exists, right. the capability exists. What hasn't always been there is the consistency and the commitment. Um, and I think that this will give us a consciousness because I think what's becoming very sad now is that even people who want to help, who have equipment, who have solutions, there are so many people around the world who've kind of been out of reach of the formal system right. that even giving help is very difficult. Even sending a, you know, a stimulus check is becoming difficult because their contributions have not been formally valued. Um, at the same time, we are literally all in this together. <laughs> and I think that, I hope that consciousness um, doesn't go away. And I think also in some cases we've become so focused on solving every little whim and fancy of the consumer that, you know, this, a lot of the sustainability problems we have are related to that. Look at the dramatic um, you know, that's probably the only positive sign so far of right. this story is that um, the amount of pollution and, and those things. So I hope that 
when we try to rebuild, it's with that consciousness that the things you do and the things you fail to do have a very far reaching impact. Um, and all of us should never underestimate that. A lot of, I've seen in a week, you know, a neighborhood posting all the way back to Ikea and Zara saying we're gonna use our factory and create, you know, masks and address this shortage right away. That's happened in a very short space of time. So if we can use tech and communication to accelerate that conversation about what really matters, um, not just to the niche groups that we presented, but if right. we're able to see the shortcomings and the hardship around the world, and I think a lot of people who may never have experienced it directly can at least see it today. Right. And I hope that that really leads us to creating and using this huge amount of talent and skill and resources for the benefit of more people in the future. So it's reassuring to see uh, that humanity still exists deeper. Yeah. And uh, this uh, situation, I think, is also a test of character and leadership. And I, I see that many organizations are rising above. Uh, you, you gave a few examples. I've heard about uh, perfume companies converting them into sanitizers, alcohol companies offering their facilities for sanitizers, uh, manufacturing companies uh, helping in terms of producing ventilators and masks. So I think everybody is trying to rise above and then uh, display their humanity to the uh, world. So Deepa, just to wrap up, I think uh, to summarize, I feel that 80% of the products uh, missed their launch date. That's what research shows. And time to market and consistency at scale are both critical in product design. So speeding up the design to development process is the key to success. And also as Deepa has said, design has to be viewed as a means of social justice so as to ensure that the fruits of design is inclusive and made available to a larger cross section of the society and all income levels. So Deepa, uh, before I just wrap up, or would you want to say a few words and then we wrap this up. Yeah, again, I'm, I'm a little, obviously, I think all of us are a little shaken um, with the speed at which, you know, problems have kind of almost felt like they've come upon us. Um, but I also see that same sense of urgency in terms of developing solutions. And I right. think that is, is really powerful. And I think that um, that sense of inclusion and that sense of collaboration and the sense of urgency together. Right. Um, I, I hope that that really um, we find a way to inject that spirit into our organizations, you know, at every level and also in our individual actions um, going forward, because this uh, is a really serious wake up call. Um, and you know, I think everyone we just uh, stay safe. But it also really highlights that we actually all have a part to play. And once people, not just in preventing problems, but also in creating solutions, I think right. as we figure out how to cope with this better, I think we don't forget that you know um, that people have a voice in in being a positive force, not just suddenly like a big you know, problem that we have to deal with. And that's, I think, maybe the one lasting uh, positive impact <laughs> that could right. happen um, from this is that our, our actions matter not uh, to a much wider audience than we might imagine. So let's hope that we all remain positive and then optimistic. And uh, thank you so much uh, for sparing your time and sharing your thoughts, knowledge and wisdom. And it's been a pleasure talking to you, Deepa. Same, Ramesh. Thank you so much for having me. And have a good day. You as well. Thank you.